and say, yes, I've got it. All right, got it. Right. So I, I feel like I've spent my life in the creative industry. So I'm very grateful to kind of catch up with you all and hopefully that I can be, hope that I can be of some kind of service to you today with what I've learned. Um, and what I've learned has been a study in uncertainty, which I'm going to argue is kind of the brief for all of us, for the challenges that we face. And it's not just the brief, I think, I hope, uh, I'm here with some kind of answer too. Um, so let me introduce you to some of the evidence that I've discovered and uncovered in my explorations into uncertainty. Um, fundamentally, however, whilst most people associate uncertainty with negativity, my hope in the next nine minutes is to prove that embracing uncertainty is also a gateway to superpowers of creativity, of problem solving, of empathy and of opportunity. Now, I know that my optimistic outlook is not the usual view of uncertainty, and we probably don't need the World Uncertainty Index, which the IMF have recently launched, to tell us that these are the most uncertain times ever. And they are. And further research shows that uncertainty is proven to be the largest single driver of anxiety disorder globally. And additional research tells us that uh, not only that, but uncertainty is the greatest driver of all instability, volatility, whether it be economic or uh, violent conflict. Uncertainty simply seems to make a hard day even harder. It pushes us backwards like a, like, a, like a headwind against our creative ambitions. And so it's no wonder that we view uncertainty negatively. But by increasing our tolerance to uncertainty, something I'm going to come back to you, I would like to show you that actually whilst we can't change the weather, we can change our response to it. And actually, at times, creatively, our ability to dance our way through the difficult weather and storms that uncertainty is going to bring. So I know that's a bold promise to make, because as well as all those external challenges, uncertainty is fundamentally a feeling, you know, and it's a, a feeling that can be pretty bloody unsettling. Uh, we've all heard and understood in our lives, you know, we should fail more and that uncertainty is good for us. Yeah, great. Intellectually, often we can cope with that. But it's the internal bit that I'm interested in, because I know for many people, uncertainty causes a feeling of fear, which often isn't really something that's easy to admit or bring to work, but it does. And in my research, the, 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 the evidence suggests that it causes a feeling of fear of things changing and equally fear of things not changing. It is a real paradox. We feel that we're going to miss out in times of uncertainty. But increasing our uncertainty tolerance really is a way forward because there is increasing evidence, very clear evidence, that by upping our uncertainty tolerance, we increase our powers of collaboration. Uh, we enter a sense of doubt, can move to a place of discovery, greater levels of empathy, understanding, problem solving, and much, much more. Some of which I'm going to begin to have the chance to detail to you, hopefully. But in this uh, unusual space, we get into really kind of core to all of your work, because whilst creativity is something we advocate, someone I was just speaking to in the breakout rooms, actually, for many people, creativity scares them. So we talk about change, but deep down, change makes us feel uncomfortable. We, you know, it was announced that the creativity is number one skill for the 21st century. But for most people in most organisations, it's conformity that gets rewarded. And so we can say all we want about the benefits and brilliance of creative industries. But for many people, it represents something that makes them feel scared, nervous. And that's because this connects to some part of our ancient autonomic nervous system, um, our protection systems. The reason for this is something that I, I really enjoy. It's called our negativity bias. Natural negativity bias in your average human being is about one in 10. That means for every 10 scenarios presented to you, every 10 opportunities, you'll judge your automatic systems will judge nine as with risk of failure, risk of looking silly, risk of being put onto the outside. Uh, and one is worth a try. Now, in times of uncertainty, negativity bias shoots straight up. The brain registers threat, the nervous system kicks into gear, and our negativity bias widens. Psychologists estimate that during the pandemic, it went to about 200 to 1. If you extrapolate 200 to 1 against a, a waking day, that means there's about 15 minutes where you, as creative leaders, will think, hmm, that's worth a try. And the rest of the time, we're thinking, no, the risk is too great and might be vulnerable because of this. So that's what we're working against. And that's why this needs some kind of change. And change is ultimately very, very possible. I'll explain why. Whilst uncertainty is something that scares us, it's something that we can shift our relationship. It's much in the same way that um, uh, aversion therapy works for phobias. Even if you have the worst phobia of spiders, if you spend every single day with increasingly sized spiders, in a very short amount of time, you'll no longer have that fear. And that's our opportunity with uncertainty. That's what's shown to increase uncertainty tolerance. 
That's my argument. Now, hopefully I'm gonna prove it. But to prove it, I need to put myself into the picture. As Mark introduced me a couple of years ago, I left my creative agency to, to write a book. It was kind of about the volatility in my own life. I thought I'd hit peak uncertainty or maybe peak midlife crisis. I was going through separation. I have two amazing little children. Uh, this business that I'd run seemed to have won all the awards for changing the world, but the world didn't really seem to have changed any the better. So I wrote a, wrote a book based on the true history of pirates and it was a, a call to arms for rebellion and rule breaking in the most positive and practical way, citing the true history of pirates as, as social agents of positive beneficial change that exists somewhere between the kind of workers' rights and, and the cooperative movement. And in fact, when it launched, I came to do a talk at the RSA, which was a huge part of that, of the book's success. But my world fell apart. I thought I was at peak uncertainty, but couldn't have got more uncertain as we rode into the pandemic. And my newly separated situation had just been resolved based on what was feeling like quite a successful career fell from under me. And within those first six months of the pandemic, I was both applying for the first job of my adult life and for insolvency. It was terrifying. And the leadership on display that frustrated me every day was simply unable to say that it didn't know what to do. The classic leadership paradigm of the 20th century is to give clear answers and a, and a bold vision for where to go. But how on earth do you lead with any kind of authenticity in a compelling way when you don't know what to do? So I went on a mission to look for new leaders and I found them. And these new leaders who had excelled in uncertainty taught me something about the opportunity, about the creativity, about the pathways for discovering the new in places of real uncertainty. So we'll put aside the politicians that we saw every day and the classic leaders, and I'll take you to the uncertainty experts a group of leaders who'd grown up as refugees on the streets, in, in prisons, or as homeless people with addiction problems and mental health challenges. And through their exposure to uncertainty had rewired themselves and emerged from the shadows of uncertainty to become leading lights in societies, CEOs and head teachers and leaders and authors and activists and others who really use the skills of uncertainty to change the world. First up was Carl Loco, a young man I met who'd grown up on the tough streets of inner city South London, predicted Oxbridge grades, but just as he got towards his exams, his best friend was murdered in front of the school and the trauma and tragedy of the streets pulled him away. He missed the exams and ended up being recruited by the local gangs. His natural attitude allowed him to rise up to be a gang leader locally, but then his, his natural compulsion to do the right thing overwhelmed him. And after a few years in the real shadows, he began intervention programs, helping others out of gangs, then social enterprises. He was recognized by Richard Branson, celebrated by Prince Harry. In fact, he was at Prince Harry's wedding and now runs a multi-million pound social investment fund for young black entrepreneurs. And I sat down and, and asked him what it was and could he encapsulate quite what uncertainty had taught him. And this, my friends, is Carl Loco. So for me, uncertainty is, and also it's the only place where you become more pliable and things are more pliable. You know, when you're certain, you kind of know the formation, you know the pattern, you can just kind of work in an unconscious way. But there is something about uncertainty that stimulates your consciousness. You know, so for me, it's like uncertainty, yes, is uncomfortable, but that discomfort is generating within you um, a heightened awareness allowing you to see what you couldn't previously, previously see, acknowledge what you wouldn't previously acknowledge, and that means that you can create what you couldn't previously create, because now you know more, so you can do more, you see more, so you can be more. Now, I interviewed Carl in my old offices in Brixton. He was from a cohort of young people that I'd worked with a lot through the justice system. And I wanted to make sure that this time around it wasn't marketing or it wasn't another book of inspiration. It was real action. So could I substantiate what Carl was saying? Is it true that in uncertainty you can be pushed to a place where you can see more than before? So I went and I found a group of scientists, specialists in uncertainty. And chief amongst them was a neuroscience specialist and behavioral psychologist called Catherine Temple Lewis, smartest woman I've ever met, three masters, actually a background in horror movies from an, from an arts perspective. And she introduced me to what goes on inside the human brain and body when it is pushed into states of uncertainty and how profoundly creative that can be. And fundamentally, scientifically, the evidence behind the claims that Carl's just made. Here is Catherine Templar Lewis to explain. You know, so for me, I'm... I know, that's Carl. Here's Catherine. Neuroplasticity is basically awesome. <laughs> it 
it's the ability for the brain to grow new pathways, right? Think of it like branches in a tree. Now, we kind of thought that that stopped after you were kids and you couldn't learn anything more. And that's bullshit. You can learn at any point in your life. You just have to make the effort to put your brain into that state where it needs to learn. It wants to learn. It can grow new pathways and those pathways become habits, become behaviors, become thoughts, become actions. Basically, you can become anyone you want to become. So I'd never heard of neuroplasticity or any of the other things that Catherine introduced me to, from negativity bias to metacognition and a range of concepts that sat behind this increasing number of stories, because there's no shortage of artists or scientists or aspects of history when it proves that uncertainty has brought the best out of us. But can we do that ourselves? Does it have to be when we're on our knees or our backs are against the wall? Or can it be by choice? Can it be by design? So I took these interesting stories of uncertainty experts and I backed them with scientific evidence. And I began to house them in an unusual space because, of course, we were all in lockdown and no one wanted just another Zoom call. And I pulled it all together with the bits of different technologies some outside broadcast software. I learned to edit. And I learned to live edit myself with a PlayStation controller and have some fun effects just to turn it into a little bit more theatre than just another team school. And I worked with the world's first empathy designer. Her art is all around asking questions, any cooker tomorrow. And she helped me art pull questions out from both the stories and the science that then reflected back on the audience via QR codes on their phone. And I worked with Morchiba to create an, a neuroaesthetic audio sensory soundscape. So all of a sudden I had this, this thing. And I was in big trouble by this point because I'd been investing in this creative project to kind of keep me sane as we were going. And I was running out of money. I was running out of road. And like I said, my circumstances wouldn't allow for that. So I decided to turn it into something. I created uh, a poster. Uh, I put some cool logos on it and I build it as the world's first interactive documentary with science behind it proven to increase your tolerance to uncertainty. I put 500 tickets available. I build it as the pilot and we sold out in three days. I had six weeks to make it. You all know what this is like, right? Building green screen stages in my house, conducting the interviews uh, all, all around the world, working with different documentary makers, and we just about pulled it off. And not just pull it off, something absolutely remarkable happened. The people who came through the program began to report incredible change. It was just a three-part documentary, right? Three one-hour episodes. People like Crystal, who then left her boring corporate job and became the CEO of this incredible music startup. Uh, Jamie, who went on to create campaigns that, that have taken on the Metropolitan Police. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of stories from this relatively small cohort of real lives changed. But beyond that, something even more extraordinary and completely unused to my background, academics got aboard. UCL, it turns out, have a specialist department for decision making in uncertainty. And the good Dr. Bilovich came aboard and created some assessments that he put before and after the documentary. So it really did become a scientific experiment. In fact, he ran it against a randomized control group to see if it was truly a, a successful psychological intervention. And it was. He built in a number of different measures which incorporate risk taking, open mindedness, decisiveness, judgment, empathy, collaboration, problem solving. But crucially, this to, to finish us up. That point I made at the beginning, lots of it's intellectually no uncertainty is supposed to be good for us, right? But the, we could increase the positive association, which we showed that we could. But most programs that attempt this are not able to reduce the negative association. So we say that uncertainty might be good for us and failing is good and tough times will teach us more. But our negative association doesn't change. In this show, in this intervention, this, this collaboration of creative arts, science, documentary and whatever else, we actually reduced people's negative effect. Their disassociation from uncertainty, that sick feeling that we spoke about, reduced. The evidence was clear and it became one of the most successful psychological interventions that they'd run. It's been picked up now in journals that I never would have gone near. In fact, just last week, I published my first ever scientific um, report. I don't even have a degree. Uh, and that's what the researcher said to me. You'll be the first person who's gone through this without a PhD. I couldn't even tell him that I didn't have a degree. Um, and it's suddenly taken on a completely different persona and a completely different world and life. Uh, Netflix have, have invested some creative and strategic financial support. We've got interest the world over. Uh, Apple have just commissioned a, a show and I'm not out of the woods by any stretch, but I've suddenly got a lifeline, a pathway to doing something completely different. And this is where we all are, right? There is no shortage of uncertainty facing the creative and arts sector. There is a, an absence of leadership, perhaps, and an imagination and ideas of where it could go. You don't need me to recount the statistics for how much the creative sector will drive people's ability through uncertainty. We know that, but we need something that's missing. So this project, when, when Mark got in touch with me and my, my, my love and support for this sector, felt like something that could connect. 
We've had some interesting recognition. Time Out gave us an amazing review where they talked about the fact that this, this kind of group therapy session really isn't for everyone, and it really isn't for everyone. But for those whom it does work for, this lovely quote in this is, for some reason, I couldn't work out why it was such a good documentary when it was so clearly stuck together with bits of sellotape. And then I realized halfway through, because whilst the characters were really exciting and compelling, you suddenly realized the whole show was just about you. And that's hopefully what this mission is set out to achieve. So if you would like to find out a little bit about your own uncertainty tolerance, the guys at UCL have built us our own short form test. Now, in, when people sign up and they buy a ticket at the show, it's like a 20 minute assessment and we really measure and prove things. But we've built a two minute version. So if you'd like a glimpse into your own uncertainty tolerance, in fact, if you'd like to come along to the show, Mark has got me to agree to doing a, a really good uh, a discount and please be my total guest. But if you'd just like in two minutes to find out what your uncertainty tolerance is, then use the QR code, come along and please take our free test. And hopefully, based on that rather enthusiastic ramble um, and those scores, we'll begin to see that it's not gonna come down to risk management, nor is it gonna come down to individual resilience. We need something better, a bit more sophisticated and forward thinking for the times that are coming our way. And hopefully, or I would think, that uncertainty tolerance might just be that thing. I hope that in some glimpse, it's as useful to you as it clearly has been to me. Sam, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I knew it was going to be, that's brilliant. Let's leave you there for a moment while people, um, I can see rounds of applause happening all over the screen, which is fantastic. Um, thank you so much. We'll leave the, 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 the code there for anyone who wants to whip out their phone and, and, and take it. Thank you very much. Sadly, we did, as you know, these hours are fast paced and, um, and we squeeze a lot in. It's fantastic that we've been able to do that. So I'm afraid we don't have time for Q&A, but Sam, if, if, uh, if you'd be kind enough to pop some contact details in, in the chat for anyone who wants to follow up, um, just, to, just to echo what um, Sam mentioned, that Sam's very generously offering a 30% discount to those here today um, on the full um, uncertainty experts experience. So, so do please let me know um, if, that's, uh, um, if you'd like more information about that. Excellent. Sam, so a, a virtual round of applause again. Thank you very much, Sam. That was great. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of comments in the chat. Meanwhile, if you'd like to stop sharing, Sam, um, you're not sharing, are you? No, you're not, sorry, I thought you were. Um, that's fine. No, I can see everybody now, great. Let's jump straight back into our rooms. Um, Sam's given us plenty to talk about. So I'll just recreate the breakout rooms. Um...